that are perhaps going to do better than others. The outperformers, the future hotspots, and hence the, the reference to vision in, in the title of the webinar today. And we're trying to give you some insights into a vision for the future by providing some clues as to um, the areas that are likely to do better than the mainstream in, uh, in 2020. Um, just a reminder also that um, in conjunction with uh, this evening's broadcast, there will be a special offer that I'm making um, for strategy sessions, one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions with myself um, at a specially discounted price for people who have registered for this evening's webinar. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the broadcast. Also be aware that um, you can uh, input your questions um, in the chat box or the Q and A panel that you should see in front of you. Um, so as I walk through, work my way through the, the presentation tonight, if you do have any questions about uh, what I'm talking about or about particular locations, um, please uh, type in your questions and I'll allow so 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the hour to deal with your question. So investing with 2020 vision, a bit of a play on words as we, uh, we move into the new year 2020 and uh, grappling with the issue that all property investors around Australia face, um, how do we know what's gonna happen in the future? And where do we know uh, the best places to buy? Because the problem with Australia is it's such a vast country, we don't have just one market. Lots of different scenarios playing out. Some places are very good uh, for investment, others not so good and some downright disastrous. And it's very important to be able to distinguish one from the other. So just before I get into the presentation proper, just a reminder that there is a special offer in conjunction with tonight's presentation, one-on-one um, -on -one strategy sessions with myself, which I'll talk about at the end of the broadcast before I get on to dealing with, uh, with your questions. And so we start a new year and indeed a new decade with a completely different atmosphere to where we were 12 months ago, at the beginning of 2019, there was a lot of negativity around media was supremely negative. A lot of what's to do with the fact that there was uh, a federal election in the offing and federal elections um, typically put a break on people's willingness to make major spending decisions. So real estate markets came to a bit of a halt. There was also a lot of negativity around in conjunction with the Banking Royal Commission 12 months on, here we are in a completely different atmosphere. We're starting this year with a, a high level of optimism for a whole host of reasons. But um, notwithstanding all of that, here's the problem that most uh, property investors face. It's all to do with mainstream media. That's where, unfortunately, most people who embark upon property investment, that's where they get their, their information, or um, I'd rather perhaps characterize it as misinformation, uh, mainstream media, People absorb media sound bites, uh, clickbait headlines, and a lot of it's um, not good information, uh, not well informed. And it means that there's an awful lot of real estate consumers out there running around with their heads full of myths and miscon misconceptions and misinformation about real estate markets. Um, and one of the big problems is generalization. Media does tend to generalize. Economists in particular who are often quoted in mainstream media about real estate issues talk in generalizations, they talk about Australia as a single market. They talk about what's going to happen this year with Australian property prices as if it's one big market where one thing is happening right around the country. And as I'll illustrate, as I get further into the pre presentation, that's simply not the case. There are so many different scenarios playing out at any given point in time. That, and that's the norm in Australia. We, it's very rare for Australia to have a genuine national property boom or a genuine national property bust where everything uh, around the country is the same. Uh, what is normal is that there are different scenarios playing out uh, at any point in time in different parts of the country. But media does generalize. So going back to March, 2019, we had a lot of headlines like this. The generalization at that time was that prices were falling everywhere. It simply wasn't true. It was certainly true of the biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne after four or five years of strong growth had got into a, what you might call a correction phase and prices were falling there. And media was extrapolating that to the whole nation and talking about prices falling across Australia. And it was very misleading, but again, it was that problem of generalization. So those sorts of headlines that you see on the screen 
right now. House price falls could feed into the wider economy. House prices record large, just annual uh, fall we've seen um, for a long time. House price fall the sharpest in five downturns. And they were talking about that as being a national situation. That simply wasn't the case because at that point in time, there are many markets around Australia where prices were rising a lot. Uh, for example, regional Victoria. Um, on the screen of a number of locations in regional Victoria, which for the last couple of years has been arguably the strongest market anywhere in Australia. And many locations at that point were experiencing really strong growth in their prices, contrary to those headlines, which were generalizing about prices falling everywhere. On the Sunshine Coast, um, particularly up around Noosa, that market was very strong, lots of um, very big growth in some of the suburbs and some of the markets in the northern part of the Sunshine Coast in particular. And Hobart was continuing to be the strongest of the capital city markets. And many of the suburbs there were having a not only double digit growth in their median prices, but in some cases, uh, median price growth in annual terms above 20%. So fast forward to the latter part of 2019. And again, media was generalizing about house prices rebounding uh, because that's what was happening in the two biggest cities. And again, they were taking that situation and turning into a national one, which is extremely misleading, giving the impression that the sorts of uh, uh, short-term burst of growth that we were seeing um, in the figures for Sydney and Melbourne was actually happening everywhere in Australia. And that simply wasn't the case. So as investors, you need to be a little bit more sophisticated than that and be better informed than that to try and pinpoint, pinpoint the best areas to buy as investors. Sensationalism is another one of the problems that uh, afflicts investors trying to figure out what's really going on in markets, but using mainstream media as their main source of information, which I often say to people is a major mistake. You actually need to be better than that. You need to be better informed than that. You need to find better ways to find out what you need to know to make good choices as investors about where to buy and what to buy in real estate. So just having a look at um, some of the information that's out there and how misleading it can be and how confusing and conflicting it can be for consumers if you use mainstream media as your main source of information for what's going on in real estate. What we have on the screen is um, the latest data from four major research sources, annual growth or decline in um, house prices in the eight capital cities of Australia. And if you examine the figures on the screen, you can see that um, there's a lot of contradiction in the figures. One source says the market might be rising strongly. Another source suggests that it's actually going backwards. And it's very, very difficult um, when media presents this information in isolation um, without presenting them as, as I do here, showing that there's, um, there's so much conflicting information out there. And it's very, very hard for consumers to get a a really clear picture about what's going on. The latest figures from CoreLogic suggest Sydney is up 6% and its house prices in annual terms. Um, SQM Research is, is quite close, but the ABS um, still has uh, Sydney prices down 4.5%. One of the problems is the ABS, the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, is actually very slow in getting its data out. So it's actually behind the game. It's about three months behind those other sources, but the main, which is a little bit more up to date, also has Sydney still down and Melbourne at zero, whereas CoreLogic and SQM Research have Melbourne sort of up four and a half or five and a half percent. For Brisbane, we have some sources just suggesting that Brisbane is rising moderately in annual terms and a couple of other sources would say that Brisbane is still down, still below where they were 12 months ago. Similar for Adelaide. With Perth, we have a situation where um, everyone seems to agree that Perth is still down in annual terms, in terms of its pricing, but how much the difference. One source is 2%, another source is 6.5%. Um, Hobart, everyone agrees that Hobart prices have been rising in annual terms, but whereas one source says it's only 2%, which is, suggests that the, the Hobart uh, property boom, which has been running along very strongly for the past two or three years, it, those figures suggest that um, the boom has passed its peak and uh, we're now getting only moderate growth in Hobart prices, but SQM research figures suggest that their uh, prices are up 13% in annual terms. So that, in contrast to what the ABS is telling us, suggests that the Hobart boom is still rocking on. Um, so lots of conflicting information, people out there. And if you um, 
read these figures in isolation, and that's the way they're presented in our newspapers and other forms of mainstream media, it can be very confusing because one set of figures from one source can uh, be conflict with the figures from another source. Looking at um, the price data in another way, the last three months of 2019 from CoreLogic, what tended to show up in the figures for most areas of Australia was that um, most jurisdictions, most of the capital cities and most of the state regional areas had actually shown significant uplift in their prices in the last quarter of 2019, particularly in Sydney and Melbourne, where there was quite a sharp turnaround, more so than what most people expected. But Brisbane, Adelaide, Hobart, Canberra also had significant uplift, but also out in the regional areas, which tend not to get a great deal of attention in mainstream media. We don't very often hear about what's happening in those markets. In some cases, they're actually performing better than many of the capital cities. So you can see from the figures on the screen that um, apart from um, uh, perhaps regional Western Australia and regional Northern Territory, most of the regional areas of Australia, uh, generally speaking, showed significant uplift in their prices in the last quarter of 2019, which means that we ended the year with uh, growth in the vast majority of the major mark jurisdictions across Australia. And that's expected to uh, carry through into the early part of 2020. And we're getting a lot of quite bullish forecasts about what's going to happen with um, property prices throughout uh, the coming year in most of the major markets in Australia. But here's another way of looking at um, what's happening with prices. Propiology, which is a very good uh, source of quality information about markets across Australia. Very good researchers published recently these figures on the net growth in median house prices in various markets around Australia over three years, so the three years to September. And uh, some surprising results there because uh, Sydney is only up 2.4%. The reason for that is, of course, Sydney had a period of growth, but uh, in the last three years, at least half of that period was um, prices um, correcting, falling. So in net terms, Sydney was only up 2.4% according to those figures. Melbourne was up 13%. The best of the capital cities by far was Hobart, which um, didn't have a price correction the way Sydney and Melbourne did. Its prices were continuing to rise. So over those, that three-year period, that recent three-year period, Hobart was by far the outstanding capital city. Its price is up 30.5% in three years. But also very interesting that the on the right-hand side of the screen, many of those regional areas that are depicted there, all of those regional areas had better price growth over three years than all of the capital cities except Hobart. So Ballarat's done very well, Burnie and Tasmania, Launceston and Tasmania have done well in regional New South Wales, regional centres like, uh, like Orange have had very good growth. So we've seen um, some significant growth in the regional areas. Regional Victoria has been very strong. Regional Tasmania has been very strong. But they tend not to get much airplay in uh, mainstream media. So uh, most real estate consumers are just pretty much absorbing information about the two biggest cities, Sydney and Melbourne, to the exclusion of all other markets and um, not being aware perhaps that there's great opportunities uh, for growth in markets beyond the big cities and some of the smaller capital cities, there's opportunities for growth and in particular in the regional areas. Another way of looking at prices, um, we every quarter do a town by town, suburb by suburb analysis so every, everywhere in Australia, looking at sales volumes and also what's happening with prices and uh, it's a different picture um, in cities like Adelaide and Brisbane, the, the overall annual figures, the generalised figures suggest there's only been perhaps one or 2% growth in the last 12 months in prices. But when you look a little bit, um, a little bit deeper um, beyond that single generalised figure, which purports to describe an entire city, you find that uh, there are precincts, there are pockets, there are sub-markets where uh, prices have done a lot better than those averages. And uh, in the case of both Adelaide and Brisbane in 2019, two thirds of suburbs had uh, achieved uh, meaningful growth in their prices. Um, and you start to realise when you do that depth of research that there are um, precincts and markets 
in those cities which appear not to be showing a lot of growth, which are doing a lot better than those averages, and true also in the regional areas, regional Victoria, uh, regional Tasmania, particularly most locations in the last 12 months in 2019 had pretty good growth in their prices, and in many cases, double digit growth, and also increasingly in regional Queensland where there's a rising number of markets making recovery uh, signs having previously been in downturn. Another way of looking at um, price figures, examining one particular local government area and looking at the different scenarios that are playing out in different suburbs. So again, making the point, you can't generalize about property prices in Australia, certainly not as a single nation with one thing happening because that's certainly not the case, but even in, within a, a, an individual city, lots of different scenarios playing at any point in time. Neighboring suburbs can be doing very different things in the last 12 months. In the Mooney Valley local government area of Melbourne, Flemington's prices are up 8%, but Airport West is down 6% and Ascot Vale 3%. And while their house prices are down in annual terms, in some cases, their uh, median prices for apartments are up a lot. In the case of Flemington, 30%, Ascot Vale 25%, uh, in contrast to what's happening uh, with their house prices. Another trend that's evidenced in those figures on the screen that many of those sub edge which are still down in annual terms have actually showed uplift in the most recent quarter, which shows that what's happening in those, those markets that in the latter part of 2019, after previously being in a pattern of declining prices, there was a turnaround towards the end of the year. And so we're now getting back into a pattern of growth in those areas. And that's uh, playing out in many parts of, of Melbourne and Sydney as we head into 2020. So as we begin this new year and indeed this new decade, uh, it's pretty clear that the real estate landscape is very different than it was 12 months ago. There's a lot more confidence in the market. Uh, we've seen um, sentiment turn around a lot. It all kind of started with the, the federal election. Um, that result was unexpected by many people, but it, it removed the uncertainty. It was putting a, a break on people making big investment decisions. It removed the, the fear that people had about some of the changes that um, Labor was proposing to property taxes. And so once that was out of the way, um, that, that released the break on activity in property markets. Um, we also saw um, in the week after the election in May, uh, after announcing changes to make borrowing allegedly easier. And then we started to see a series of reductions in the official interest rate, which um, led on to um, reductions in mortgage rates from many of the major lenders. Um, so borrowing not only became easier, again, allegedly, as a result of the APRA changes, but um, it became cheaper as well. We also had um, the new scheme for assistance to first home buyers, which started on the 1st of January. That was legislated through the various houses of parliament. So that was also in the mix and uh, tax cuts were also legislated. So there's a lot of positive things that, that started with the federal election result and then followed on from that. So as we got towards the end of uh, 2019, all of those, uh, that, that series of fortunate events was all starting to play into property markets and uh, across the country, particularly in the bigger cities. Uh, demand started to rise, but uh, supply was still low. And so we saw an impact on prices. So we're now seeing a lot of bullish forecasts for what's going to happen. Generally speaking with the real estate prices uh, throughout 2020, uh, some of the, the big name sources, the major banks and other sources of information about Australian real estate markets are predicting uh, quite strong increases in prices, some more so than others. Um, SQM Research, and it's one of its um, more bullish scenarios suggesting prices could rise by up to 15%. Uh, Westpac recently published its forecast, a little bit less bullish than that, but still predicting uh, increases of six or 7% in Sydney and Melbourne and about 8% in Brisbane. So it's just suggesting that Brisbane's actually gonna show higher growth than the two biggest cities in 2020. So <clears throat> the problem for real estate investors um, against that background is trying to figure out, okay, where's the best places to buy? I've conversations with uh, 
real estate consumers pretty much every day in one form or other. And um, they're all grappling with that, that problem. You know, where's the best place for us to buy? It's a very big country. There's lots of different options. And it's very hard to make those choices. So what I want to do is um, uh, suggest some of the ways that you can, you can reduce the number of options and um, make some clear decisions about the best place for you to focus on. Uh, firstly, the fact that we don't have just one market is actually a really good thing. Um, it's, diversity is definitely an asset. It means that uh, usually in Australia, at any one point in time, there are there's somewhere that's on the on the cusp of a growth phase. In fact, there's usually lots of places that are. Um, what we've seen in the, say the last five years, that period when Sydney and Melbourne were very strong, Perth and Darwin are actually going backwards through that same period. And places like Brisbane and Adelaide were, were kind of just chugging along with very moderate growth. That's the norm for Australia. It's normal that we have those that scenario where there's lots of different market cycles playing out at different times. So it's not just one market. Um, so it would su probably surprise people to know that uh, since 1970, so in the last 50 years, how many years out of the last 50 years have we seen instances where the biggest cities of Australia all had property booms at the one time? And the answer is there's only actually been four years out of the last 50 where the major cities of Australia are all doing the same thing. They've all been having property booms at once. It's actually very rare for Australia to have a genuine national property boom. There was one in the late 80s. It was quite prolific. And in the early part of this century, uh, 2001, 2003, and in 2004, in some instances, most parts of Australia did have some good growth in those periods, but that's rare. Um, what we normally have in Australia is scenarios where uh, different markets are doing different things. And the reason for that is property markets essentially arise out of what's happening in a local economy, something I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, so at different points in history, we've seen different uh, cities of Australia leading the growth. Um, most of the cities of Australia have had, had, have had their turn as the growth leaders. Sydney, for the most recent five-year period, you can see on the screen on the left there, was the leader in terms of how much uh, growth occurred between 2013 to 2017. Prior to that, it was Darwin, rather surprisingly, because in the last five years, the Darwin markets have been very much in decline and still stuck in the mire. Before that was Perth, again, surprisingly for some people perhaps because Perth is still uh, struggling to uh, recover from several years of declining values, quite a significant and prolonged downturn in Perth. And it's easy for people to forget that uh, in the past, Perth has been quite a strong and prolific growth market. It's been a national leader on population growth. It's been a national leader on price growth, particularly in that period in the early part of the century, 2003 to 2007, there was amazing growth in the Perth market. Um, Melbourne's had its turn down. Uh, it's had a couple of turns at the top in terms of being the, the capital city with the highest price growth over a five year period in Brisbane going back to the late 80s, early 90s was the, the national leader. So uh, it's, it's quite common for, for different markets at different times to be the premier place to go for growth and again, the dilemma for property investors everywhere is to try and uh, figure out, okay, in the year to come or the next three years or in the next five years, which locations are going to be the ones that are going to be the market leaders? Because those are the ones I want to buy in now and pick up that growth that's going to occur over, say, the next three or five or 10 years. Just again, reinforcing that uh, at any point in time, there's different locations at different points of the cycle. And this is from uh, here in Todd White. Value as a recent report of theirs where they uh, depicted at which stage of the cycle different locations, different markets around Australia were. Um, some markets they felt were at the peak of the cycle, others were falling. Some like Sydney and Melbourne at that point were at the bottom and now probably the next report will suggest that those markets are in recovery. Other markets they described as rising markets and others as near their peak. And again, it's situation normal for Australia. At any point in time, you're going to find that scenario where different locations are at different points of the cycle. And that's a, that's a positive for you as property investors. That means that um, at any point in time when you're looking to be an investor and you're trying to figure out where to buy, you want to be buying somewhere that's perhaps at the, the bottom of the cycle or moving into recovery. That's a good time to be buying in those places when a market's moving off the bottom of the trough 
and starting to move into a growth phase again in the recovery period, um, that's the optimum time to be buying. Unfortunately, what most people do is they wait till they read in the paper that there's a boom on somewhere. That's when they pile into a market, which means that the prices have been rising for a significant period already by the time that they buy. So they've missed um, quite a substantial amount of the growth that's coming out of that uh, recovery and that rising market. So the, the, uh, the objective for a new property investor is to, to find those markets that are coming into a period of growth. And I'm gonna give you um, some clues as to um, how to, to pinpoint some of the markets that are at that point where they're about to move into a growth phase and start to produce good price growth in coming years. So let's talk about some of the leading indicators for future growth. Um, one of the things that we know to be true from all the research that we do in my sort of 35 years of experience in uh, real estate research and writing about it and as an investor myself is that there, um, there's a strong correlation between the local economy and the performance of property markets. Um, property markets essentially arise out of what's going on with local economy. Um, the big macro factors, the, the national factors like the level of interest rates, they can be important, but they're not the prime driver. Um, they're not the, the things that actually dictate whether a market's rising or falling. Um, it's actually the local economy that's essential. So what I'm doing here with this slide is I'm putting um, on the left-hand side, the rough rankings uh, in economic terms for the states and territories and on the right-hand side, a, a general ranking of the, the performance of their property markets in the capital cities over say the last three or four years. Um, the Comsec State of the State report comes out every quarter and they rank the eight uh, states and territories in terms of economic performance. And for the last several years, there's been a competition between Victoria and New South Wales, who's been number one or who's been number two. Tasmania has risen up the rankings, um, used to be rock bottom last for many years, but it's um, gone through uh, something of a growth phase um, for various reasons. And Tasmania has, has ranked either number three or number four in recent years in that ComSec report. The ACT is consistently third or fourth, and then Queensland. Down the bottom, the two most struggling economies in recent years have been Western Australia and Northern Territories. Those are the ones that are most uh, strongly aligned with the cycles of the resources sector, which can be very volatile. And um, when the resources sector is in downturn, uh, states like Western Australia tend to suffer. So that's reflected in the general performance of the property markets of the capital cities. We've seen Victoria and New South Wales being the strongest economies by far. And quite clearly in the last four or five years, Melbourne and Sydney have been the top performing uh, property markets in terms of price growth. Hobart has also done very well, not as spectacularly perhaps, and not for as long as the two biggest cities, but for the last three years, Hobart has done very well and produce good growth. And it's not a coincidence that that's happened at a time when the Tasmanian economy is ranked uh, third or fourth in the, uh, in the national rankings by Comsec. Um, the improvement in the Tasmanian economy has been uh, very significant in driving the growth markets that we've seen in Hobart and also in other parts of Tasmania. The ACT has always got a very solid economy. It's got an unfair advantage being the, the national capital. Um, highest average incomes, the lowest unemployment typically. And the Canberra market's always very solid. It's selling booms, it's selling bus, it just chugs along um, in, a, in a very steady fashion. So a very safe place to own real estate. Um, Queensland's been a bit of an underachiever in recent years. So uh, the Brisbane market has reflected that. It hasn't been growing strongly. It hasn't followed the example of Melbourne and Sydney. A lot of people um, have predicted in recent years that Brisbane was going to have a boom. I think they simply assumed that because Sydney and Melbourne had that, um, that Brisbane would follow suit. So, well, Brisbane hasn't because it hasn't had the drivers that Sydney and Melbourne had. It hasn't had the economic strength and some of the other factors that, are, that I'll talk about in a moment, population growth uh, and infrastructure spending in particular, big factors that have driven those um, Melbourne and Sydney economies and cause their property markets to do what they've done. Well, Brisbane has lacked that, but that's changing now. Very similar for Adelaide. Um, and down the bottom, Perth and Darwin are the markets where prices have been going backwards in recent years. And it's a reflection of the fact that their state and territory economies 
of which say the capital cities um, have been performing so poorly and uh, population growth has been uh, much less than before, not as many jobs being created as before. So infrastructure spending is one of the big factors, one of the, I think, the prime reasons why Sydney and Melbourne have been such growth markets in real estate um, as a consequence of their very strong local economies has been the infrastructure spending has been so high. Sydney in particular has been spending many tens of billions of dollars on new rail links, new motorways, upgrades, um, universities, um, hospitals, all those major points of infrastructure. Um, those such big generators of economic activity and, and such big generators of new jobs and out of that comes demand for real estate. So infrastructure spending is something to look for, not just in the big cities, but also in the regional markets. Um, when you're researching an area, look, look, look at what's happening with infrastructure spending in that location. And um, it can be a clue to future growth in this property market. So we've recently seen that in Sydney and Melbourne. Tasmania, relative to its size, has also been spending quite a bit on uh, infrastructure in various forms. And that's been a big influence of um, the rising property markets that we've seen in those capital cities in recent years. Um, and Brisbane and Adelaide haven't done much in that regard, but that's starting to change. Brisbane has lagged behind Sydney and Melbourne because it hasn't had the big infrastructure spend. Well, that's changing now. We're now starting to see the projects, the big projects like Cross River Rail, uh, the expansion of the Brisbane Airport and, and a host of other projects um, that have been talked about for years, that have been in planning for years, now starting to get to the point where actually starting to happen and money starting to be spent and jobs are starting to be created. So it's one of the several reasons why I think that uh, Brisbane this year is going to do a lot better than it has in recent years. Adelaide also, Adelaide relative to its size has been uh, starting to spend quite big, particularly on its... Uh, its transport network, its road network and uh, rail uh, network. Uh, a lot of investment going in in Adelaide, some um, other things happening, uh, investment around the, the big contracts to build vessels for the Navy, $90 billion worth. Um, that's happening in Adelaide. It's also uh, infrastructure being developed in what I call the high-tech innovation space for which Adelaide is definitely the capital of Australia. Uh, that's also where the new Australian uh, space agency is being located so there's quite a bit coming up in the future of of both those two smaller capital cities and that's why i'm particularly bullish about their prospects for price growth this year and beyond um, should also look out for what's happening with um, infrastructure spending in some of our major uh, regional centers um, the sunshine coast is is a great example i'll talk about it in more detail later uh, Townsville is another one, which is a market that's been in the doldrums for several years, uh, but it's on the, the brink of much better times. And the main reason why I believe that is there's such a big infrastructure spend in the works for Townsville. Some of it's already happening. Um, other parts of it is in planning and soon to happen. Uh, once uh, more of those infrastructure projects get underway in Townsville, we're going to see their property market rising. Geelong's been doing very well in recent years and there's been a lot of business investment and infrastructure spending happening there. Ballarat and Bendigo, two cities that have uh, in regional Victoria were strong, diverse economies um, growing in their population, creating jobs, infrastructure spending like the, the new $700 million hospital in Bendigo, um, driving their local economies, uh, new people moving there to live and work, um, affordability, is a factor there. Their strong link, transport links to the capital city, Melbourne, is another factor. So those markets in the last year or so are really starting to thrive. Newcastle long term is also one, a great place to consider. Uh, big infrastructure spend there. A lot of investment happening in the Newcastle market. Um, so it's another one to consider. Orange, uh, not that far from Sydney. Um, one I'll talk about uh, towards the end of the broadcast when I give some examples of locations that I think people should be considering in uh, 2020 and beyond for, for investment um, and infrastructure spending is one of the reasons why I think uh, places like the Sunshine Coast and Orange um, are markets that uh, investors should really be considering. Okay, 
One of the best ways to determine where prices are going to rise in the near future is to track sales volumes. Uh, that's something that we do at Hotspotting. Uh, every quarter we get uh, raw data. We buy raw data on the number of sales that have taken place for every town and suburb right across Australia, and we look for the patterns. Where there's a, a pattern of growth in sales activity, you know, there's a pretty good chance the prices are going to rise there. There's a bit of a time lag. Um, market activity starts to pick up. The number of sales starts to rise. And as a consequence of that, maybe within six or nine months, the, the impact of those prices start to rise as the market starts to understand that activity is picking up and it works the same way in reverse, where sales activity is falling away, we're likely to see price growth coming to an end or even prices falling. And we saw that you know, in Sydney long before uh, Sydney prices went off the boil and then started to decline. We could see it in this exercise that we do every quarter when we chart sales volume, we go through in the entire city of Sydney, suburb by suburb, and we could see the sales volumes falling off um, a couple of years, in fact, before uh, we got to, say, 2018, we started to see prices actually declining in Sydney. For the past uh, two years, the pattern, the market had peaked perhaps two years before in terms of sales activity, and we could see the, the um, firstly, the decline in the rate of growth, and then the actual decline in prices coming by following sales activity. Now, that's not so easy for, for all of you out there um, in consumer land to actually do um, because it means you've got to do what we do, which is buy uh, the raw data and, and analyze it the way we do. It's a very big job. So to make it easy for you, we publish a report every quarter called the Price Predictor Index. And that's the result of this analysis that we do every quarter, looking at sales volumes and sales patterns um, and price patterns. Uh, for every town, every suburb in the country. And we're looking for the markets where uh, demand is rising or is consistent or is falling because it's a clue to what's going to happen with prices. So rather than trying to conduct that, that huge exercise yourself, so I would suggest that um, the easiest way to do it um, would be to get a copy of the price predictor index and uh, where we describe um, the patterns that we're seeing and the places where we expect our prices to rise because sales activity is rising or um, perhaps to fall because sales activity is falling away. We're soon going to launch the research for the, the next edition. Uh, the figures, I think next week, will be available for the December quarter and it's going to tell us what uh, was happening at the end of 2019, which feeds into the early part of 2020 in terms of trends with sales, which leads into prices. Okay, one of the best ways to get a clue to the markets that are actually going to perform well with prices is to, to look at vacancy rates. Vacancy rates is, is very much uh, an underrated and overlooked fact, factor in, uh, in mainstream media. Media tends to talk exclusively about auction clearance rates and movements in median prices, um, monthly, quarterly, annual movements in prices, which tells you about the recent past, but it doesn't actually tell you about what's going to happen in the near future, which is basically what you want to know about. As real estate investors, you really want some clues. What are the areas that are going to show growth this year and beyond? Uh, vacancy rates can be uh, a really strong clue. Um, and the vacancy rates, according to SKM Research, uh, for the Australian capital cities currently on the screen, you can see that Hobart is 0.5%. Now, it's been like that for several years. It's one of the reasons why Hobart house prices have risen as strongly as they have over the last two to three years, because there's a, a real shortage of um, of real estate in the Tasmanian capital. Um, and its vacancies have been well below 1% for several years. And that's mean rents have been rising and out of that has come um, rising prices. Um, Canberra has also been a very low vacancies. Adelaide is low. And we think that it's one of the reasons why the Adelaide market's gonna show stronger growth in 2020 because there's uh, such tight supply in the market and because uh, there's very low vacancies, that means there's competition for rental properties. That means rents are rising. Um, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, Darwin vacancies are still too high. They've been uh, very high for a number of years. They're still not down below 3%. So rents aren't rising. And it's very, very difficult in those circumstances for prices to rise. Uh, Sydney has also got quite high vacancies now. And uh, that's uh, a bit of a problem going forward for the for the Sydney market. Recently, um, SQM Research published um, 
the locations around Australia where the vacancies were the lowest. And uh, what it shows, if you look at the, the suburbs listed on the left-hand side of the screen, you see that uh, they're all in um, Adelaide and Hobart or close to um, and some of those locations in Tasmania, a little bit out of Hobart, but Tasmania and South Australia have all of the, the tightest rental markets um, in Australia right now. And um, if you look at some of the figures on the right-hand side of the screen, some of those locations with almost zero vacancies um, have had very strong growth in their rentals. Kingston, which is just outside Hobart, vacancy rate according to SCM research of 0.2%, which means almost nothing available to rent. And so rents have risen in the last 12 months from a median weekly rent of $438 a week to over 500. That's, that's a massive increase. And so we've seen some of those locations with very tight vacancies producing that kind of rental growth. And when rents are growing like that, prices um, are likely to follow. We saw that in Sydney. Before Sydney got on its um, growth curve, say 2003, 13 into 2014 with its prices. Before that, we had a couple of years where vacancies were very low in Sydney and rents were rising, but prices hadn't. And uh, for people who understand the trends in real estate, that was a signal that it was a good time to buy in Sydney back in about 2012, 2013, because vacancies were low, rents were rising strongly, prices hadn't done anything, but they were likely to do so on the back of those trends in the rental market. So it's a really good clue to look out for when you're doing your research, trying to figure out where should I be buying? Um, check out the vacancy rates. You can do it very easily by going to the SQM research uh, website. That kind of information is freely available. Um, you don't have to pay for it. You can key in the postcode anywhere in Australia and it'll give you the current vacancy rate. In fact, it'll give you a chart showing the pattern of vacancies over the last, say, the last five years. And that can give you a strong clue about whether a, a market's a good place um, for you to buy, whether, um, you know, if it's really tight vacancies and rents are rising, you know, we're, we're likely to see price uplift on the back of that. So it's a very good clue for identifying uh, future. A lot of regional markets have very low vacancies, and I've listed just some examples there, Ballarat and Victoria across Ballarat, um, about one and a half percent. Mackay in Queensland, that's a, a good example because say th three, four years ago, vacancies in Mackay and central Queensland were five, six or more percent. Very high, rents were falling, prices were falling, but gradually that oversupply has been um, absorbed. And now vacancies are down to 1.5% around about there in Mackay. And it's a very competitive rental market. So rents are rising um, as that economy has improved uh, for various reasons. And so that's starting to put impetus in prices in Mackay. Um, Wyala in South Australia, it's a market that's been through several years of downturn. It was a boom market previously when the resources investment boom was at its peak. Wyala was very popular with investors and then it had a crash. Vacancies were very high at one point and values fell, but that, so we're now seeing recovery happening in that market. Vacancies are now down uh, well below 2% in Wyala. And in the last 12 months, median prices and the various components of that market have started to rise again quite strongly. Gladstone in Queensland, um, a location that's, that's hurt a lot of investors who bought sort of back in 2012-13 when uh, there was a major economic boom happening there because of the big gas projects and um, developers piled in and bought far too many new houses and apartments and oversupplied that market and vacancies went above 10% and so values fell in Gladstone. So you can see again, whether rising or falling, um, vacancy rates are a very big influence on what happens with prices. So Gladstone prices fell, but what we're now seeing is recovery in the Gladstone market because vacancies are now down at acceptable levels. They were at 10%. The last say three years they've been gradually and steadily falling and so we now got to the point where vacancies in Gladstone are maybe around two percent rents are starting to rise and we're now seeing evidence some of the suburbs of Gladstone where in the last 12 months median house prices have started to rise again so it's uh, that market is on the way back now um, just a reminder um, before I go any further got any questions just key them into the uh, the chat box or the Q&A panel. And uh, just shortly when I finish the, the main part of the presentation, uh, we're getting towards the end of it, um, 
I'll do my best to answer as many of those questions as I can. Um, but to illustrate the point that I'm making about the correlation between vacancies and uh, likely future price movement, Ballarat's a great example. For the last five years, vacancies in Ballarat have been uh, below 3%. For the last two years, have been uh, below 2%. Now, currently around about 1.5%. Some of the postcodes of Ballarat listed on the screen there, one of them is 0.4%, so almost no vacancy. A couple of the others, 1.5%. Uh, 1.8%, so very, very tight rental markets. As a result of that, we've seen, um, sorry. Hit the wrong button. Uh, rents have risen about 20% in Bella uh, in the last three years. As a consequence of the, the low vacancies, the very tight rental market. And in the last 12 months, many of the suburbs of uh, Ballarat have, have had very strong growth in their median prices. So you can see that the, um, there's evidence of the correlation between when you've got a period where vacancies have been low for a, a number of years and rents have risen for say three years, you've got that pattern where prices do tend to follow. And there's a pattern that being played out in many places around Australia where that holds true. Vacancies low, rents rising, and out of that comes rising prices. So it's a very good market to look for and the information that you need to um, determine those places um, is available. They're available in the reports that we publish on hotspotting.com.au. We, we do highlight those trends. They're part of the reason why we nominate or recommend the areas that we do. And you can also get good information about vacancy rates by going to the SCAM research uh, website as well. Okay, so to sort of finish off, the presentation tonight, I thought I'd just um, give three examples of, of areas that sort of tick a lot of the boxes on some of the indicators that we're talking about. Um, strong local economy is really important. Uh, diversification in the economy, jobs being created, um, vacancies low, um, infrastructure spending high. Those, those are some of the key ones. And the, I'm just gonna focus on three locations in different parts of Australia too. Just to give you an idea of some of the places that we think uh, investors should be considering in 2020 uh, for growth this year and beyond. Um, first one, I've got a um, very strong wrap on uh, Adelaide, I think very underrated market. I think it's gonna do really well. Um, things happening in that local economy. Economic growth has been above national averages for the last couple of years in uh, South Australia, particularly Adelaide, um, very good value for money city in terms of its real estate, a lot happening in the high tech innovation space. City of Marion's uh, perhaps eight, 10, 12 kilometers southwest of the Adelaide CBD, a very good uh, market for investors to consider. Uh, strong local economy, it's got the uh, Flinders University campus, it's got the Flinders Medical Precinct and the uh, the graphic on the screen is the Tonsley Innovation Precinct, all these very close together. Lots of jobs there, lots of things happening, rail links um, and road links to the centre of Adelaide. Um, very affordable prices. Most of the suburbs in that precinct are medium prices for houses in the 400,000, some are in the 500,000. Uh, vacancies below 1% right throughout the city of Marion, local government area. There's new investment coming in there. There's jobs being created and the Tonsley Innovation Precinct. Um, there's expansion happening with the, the University Medical Precinct. Um, rail links are being extended one stop further down the line to the, the Flinders University uh, Medical Precinct. And we're starting to see prices rising. And I think this year and beyond, uh, Adelaide generally, and in particular, the city of Marion is, is gonna do really well. Another, a place I think people can consider orange in New South Wales. It's really standing out for us at the moment. Um, when I, you know, a classic example of why I think investors should consider regional Australia more. I think um, regional, there's a potential for regional Australia to be a win-win-win situation for property investors. The first win is much cheaper buying prices than the big cities. The second win is much better rental yields. And the third one is you're going to get really good capital growth if you choose wisely. I think Orange, it's one of those places, it's got diversity and strength in its economy. That's one of the most important thing. Major infrastructure, expansion of businesses like the, the local Cardia Gold Mine is about to embark on a 
$800 million expansion. It's a major employer. The local medical precinct is expanding, creating more jobs. It's big, big uh, investment in that particular infrastructure. Vacancies are low there. Prices are affordable. The median price for Orange at the moment for houses is around 400,000. So a lot of houses sell in the 300,000s. Very good track record of growth. Um, new investment coming in. We're starting to see evidence that prices are rising in Orange. Um, Orange has um, a number of government departments, including some state um, government department headquarters, uh, a major medical precinct, and um, quite often people come to Orange, maybe from Sydney, to um, work in the government department or in the medical facilities or perhaps study at one of the local university campuses, intending to stay maybe for a short period, but actually like it and stay long term. Um, it's a lot more affordable than Sydney, uh, earning similar amounts of money with your, your job, but um, the cost of living is so much lower and it's much easier to buy real estate there at local prices. And the third example, uh, the Sunshine Coast, which I think is uh, one of the, the most remarkable growth stories anywhere in Australia in terms of its, what I call it, economic evolution or revolution, perhaps more correctly, um, driven primarily by a huge infrastructure spend, the new medical precinct, uh, which is a $5 billion work in progress. Um, the airport's going international. Um, there's a new CBD being built from the ground up in Maruchi Door, which over time is going to be you know, billions of dollars of investment. There's so much happening. The subsea cable bringing uh, the fastest uh, internet connections between the east coast of Australia and Asia is going to be coming to the Sunshine Coast. Um, and all of that's bringing an influx of new residents, uh, people coming to live on the Sunshine Coast, perhaps work in the new medical precinct, the new $2 billion university hospital. Some of them earning pretty good money. So it's really put some impetus in the top end of the Sunshine Coast market up around Noosa, for example. Vacancies low, prices starting to rise. Uh, taking a long-term view, I just think that uh, the Sunshine Coast is you know, an excellent market to consider. So those are three possibilities. There are many more. Um, you know, there, there are dozens uh, of good locations, both in capital cities, Australia, and in regional Australia that you might want to consider. I'd suggest that it's, it's a year for the, the smaller capital cities like Brisbane and Adelaide to shine, uh, Perth to make a recovery from several years of downturn, and some of these regional centres like the Sunshine Coast, like Orange, like Bendigo and Victoria, I think we're going to see a really good market performance this year and beyond. Uh, special offer today, um, in conjunction with this event, um, people have registered for the webinar. Um, I'm offering uh, one of my strategy sessions, which um, uh, are generally available one-on-one, uh, -on one-hour one session with myself. Usually it happens uh, because I'm in one part of Australia, probably uh, somewhere else, interstate. It usually happens via Skype or Zoom meeting, but it's a one-on-one -on -one strategy session where we talk about your situation, help you make some plans, develop some strategies uh, for property investment. Normally it's uh, uh, $330, but uh, the special offer tonight, it's $220. So if you're interested in doing that to help you uh, make some plans for uh, what you're gonna do with property investment this year, um, go to the hot spotting website, the homepage, you'll see then click on the investors button and you'll see strategy system, uh, strategy sessions as one of the options that will drop down there. I just want you to keep this in mind. I believe um, there's lots of mistakes that investors make, but I think the biggest single one is an, a lack of willingness to invest time or money to make sure that they actually do property investment well. Um, people are reluctant to put in time and they're reluctant to spend money on advice or research. And I think it's a mistake. If you're unwilling to spend money, you should be willing to spend some time. But a lot of investors aren't willing to do either. And so they're destined to get perhaps a, a poor result, in some cases a disastrous one. So with the, um, the strategy session offer, it's an opportunity to invest a little bit of time and a small amount of money uh, to get a really good uh, head start on your planning for what you're going to do this year and beyond as property investor. So that's the offer uh, for 220, which normally costs 330. Uh, strategy session. Um, so go to the Hotspotting website if you're interested in taking up that special offer, which will be current until the end of the week.
Um, also wanted to uh, alert you to another upcoming event. Um, I'm going to be doing what I call uh, a masterclass in the form of a webinar on the 18th of February. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, 10 key strategies that most investors don't know about and don't uh, consider. And that particular event, which is a ticketed event, and there's going to be limited to just 10 people. Uh, so 10 people, and the first 10 people to, to book for that masterclass will be it. And anyone who does book will get a free uh, strategy session as part of uh, the price they pay for that special masterclass event on the 18th of February. So we still have a little bit of time in the hour to, to deal with some of your questions. Thank you, um, those who have been watching and listening, and thanks for putting in your questions. Um, Sandy asking about Deception Bay in Queensland, that's in the northern part of uh, the Brisbane Metropolitan Area, Deception Bay in the, uh, the Moreton Bay local government area in the north of Brisbane. Uh, generally speaking, I think the Moreton Bay local government area is one to consider. Very affordable, um, good buy-in prices, um, proximity to major jobs nodes, good rental yields. Uh, there's a new university campus under construction in that general area. And Deception Bay is one of those areas which I think is slowly undergoing a bit of a renaissance. It's been considered a little bit down market in the past, but it's gradually sort of being uh, upgraded, gentrified. And I think um, you know, the buying prices are still pretty attractive there, Sandy. Um, and I think that going forward, it should show some pretty solid growth. You can also buy a property in the Deception Bay area where you're buying a house on a block of land, which um, if the, the size of the block and the zoning is correct, you have the the right, the ability to um, redevelop it in the future with say townhouses. So that's um, an opportunity to look out for in that market. Uh, Rowan asking thoughts on Werribee in Melbourne's West. Um, Werribee um, and other suburbs of Wyndham City that's in um, sort of the Southwest of the Melbourne metropolitan area heading down to uh, Geelong uh, has um, shown very good growth uh, during the latter part of Melbourne's re recent cycle, some of those those suburbs had you know, exceptional growth over, say, the last couple of years. And like most parts of Melbourne, have recently undergone a bit of a correction. But um, you know, it was attracted by affordability and uh, you know, good transport links um, to the centre of Melbourne. Uh, some major jobs nodes there as well. So I think you know going forward, taking a long-term view, it's going to be a good solid place to um, to own real estate. Um, Peter's asking about Townsville. There are lots of flood-prone zones, and some of the impacts on landlord insurance. Um, yeah, I'm sure um, insurance premiums have become exorbitant, particularly as um, about 12 months ago there was a major flood event in Townsville. That's certainly something you have to be aware of if you're investing in Townsville. I think it's got a good future. Townsville's a pretty solid uh, regional city. Um, it's got a good future and, and there's lots in the pipeline for infrastructure spending. So I think it's going to come into better times. But um, if you're an investor buyer there, you are likely to be paying a pretty high premium for, for insurance there because of um, well, extreme weather events that have happened in, in the past, including 12 months ago with the major floods that happened there. Um, but certainly, uh, Peter, if you're investing in Melbourne, you need to check out which areas 12 months ago actually were impacted by the floods. I mean, it was a relatively small proportion of the overall city was flooded. Uh, you just need to know uh, which parts were and which parts weren't, and obviously avoid the parts that were we're shown to be prone to flooding. I think you can probably say, because that was such an exceptional event, you know, remarkable weather event that uh, any part of Townsville that didn't get flooded in that event is, is probably quite safe. But um, you go to the council and check out the information they have about, uh, you know, the flood, flood plain areas. Job is asking, which is the best suburb to invest for growth? Um, Sorry, um, in all of Australia, one suburb. It's a little bit hard to answer that, um, Jobby. Um, 
perhaps if you could sort of be a little bit more specific about what you're looking for. I mean, it's impossible to, to pick just one suburb in the entire nation that's better than anywhere else. Um, it tends not to be. Um, I think it's a bit of a fallacy that um, media is always trying to nominate the best suburbs to buy and it's, it's very seldom one suburb that's going to outperform all the ones around it aren't going to be doing similar things. But we tend to think in terms of precincts, clusters of suburbs, local government areas, uh, because um, if this suburb is rising, the ones next order are going to be getting similar up because they're all influenced by similar factors. Um, so... Yeah, a um, little bit difficult to answer that very general question. Um, uh, Peter's asking uh, with reference to what I said about uh, the Marion Council area, that's in Adelaide, uh, the city of Marion. Do you have a view on Hallett Cove, Marion Rhinella? Look, um, Hallett Cove is good, it's um, sort of bayside, so it, that's that's an advantage. But I'd actually want to be one of those suburbs that's um, actually in the heart of where all the, um, you know, all the jobs are. The, the Flinders University, the Flinders Medical Precinct, the Tonsley Innovation Precinct, they're clustered quite close together. Now, suburbs like Club Alley Park and Marion itself and others that are right next to all of that. It's also where the train stations are. Those are the ones that I'd want to be buying an investment property in if I was going to buy some in the city of Marion because it's where the infrastructure is, where the jobs are, where people are coming every day um, to go, go to the university or the hospitals precinct or to the Tonsley Innovation Precinct. Um, that's where I'd be focusing. Um, Sandy's asking about another part of Adelaide, which is up in the north suburbs like Elizabeth, um, yep, um, the Elizabeth suburbs. I think that northern part of, of uh, Adelaide has a good potential. It's, it's the most affordable real estate anywhere in capital city Australia and really good rental yields. And there's lots of really big jobs nodes up there like the Edinburgh Defence Precinct. Um, so you can buy very, very affordably and get great rental yields um, up in those, um, you know, the city of Playford, um, for example, and the local government area of Salisbury. Um, you've just got some of them are down market areas and you need to you know, check out what you're buying and have it thoroughly checked out by building and pest inspectors and all of that. But there's really good potential to buy very affordably um, there. Um, just um, looking at some of the other questions that are coming through. Um, Growth prospects for Gympie. Sally's asking about Gympie. I think Gympie's got good prospects. It's um, It benefits from all that's happening on the Sunshine Coast, which I mentioned in some detail in the presentation. Um, but it's, and it's transport connections between Gympie and the Sunshine Coast have improved because of upgrades to the motorway. Um, but Gympie's a lot cheaper than the Sunshine Coast. So you're finding like first name buyers going to Gympie to buy affordably and sort of commuting to jobs on the Sunshine Coast, although Gympie itself also is creating jobs, it's, it's quite a, uh, a strong and um, a growth regional town at the heart of lots of good things that are happening in the tourism industry and other things. Uh, so it's one to consider, certainly a place to buy affordably um, with prospects for growth. Um, I'm just trying to get my cursor in the right place. Um, the question here with prices is up as high as 26% in Black Hill, that's in Ballarat. One of the slides I had on the screen earlier. Um, would you still buy there on another suburb? Well, I mean, the points that you make is a good one. Uh, would you buy in an area that's already had such high growth or would you be looking elsewhere? Um, I would certainly suggest that um, you know, Ballarat's still going to have some growth going forward, but the best time to buy there was, say, one to two years ago. I would suggest actually considering Bendigo as an alternative because it's a little bit further back in the cycle compared to Ballarat. It's just starting to, to uh, show elevated growth. So it's got similar qualities uh, to Ballarat, a lot to recommend it, um, similar pricing levels, uh, rental yields. So I'd be perhaps, I think okay, Ballarat's already had substantial growth. What about um, looking at Bendigo, which has perhaps got a little bit more upside? Um, 
Uh, another question about Gimpy, which I've just answered. I think it's it's worth considering as a an affordable alternative uh, to the Sunshine Coast, to which it is well connected um, because of the upgrades to the motorway. So it's sort of commutable. Um, the Onka Paringa region in South Australia. So that's up down. Um, so Karina is asking about Onka Paringa in the south of Adelaide. Um, yeah, it's one of the one of the growth areas of the Adelaide market. It's Adelaide doesn't traditionally have very sort of high population growth, um, but um, probably on Kapuringa because it's got new new growth areas, um, land for new suburbs. Um, it, it's one part of the Adelaide market that does show good population growth. It's got some Bayside suburbs. It's got uh, new development suburbs. It's got um, a noted wine region as part of it as well. The transport infrastructure has improved because the rail links have been extended down there and the Southern Expressway has been upgraded. So it's certainly one to consider. Affordable buying, pretty good prospects for growth. Um, Vicky asking where to buy a family home in Melbourne with good growth. I'd, look, I'd suggest, um, there's, I mean, there's so many options. Melbourne is a very big city, but Looking a little bit north of the Melbourne CBD, um, local government areas like Darabin, um, those suburbs like sort of Northcote and Brunswick, um, Coburg, those sorts of suburbs. Um, there are affordable apartments there, um, well located, um, close to important things um, like the, uh, the hospitals and university precinct, which is around sort of Carlton Parkville. Um, those sort of suburbs not far from there, I think is a very good place to consider in Melbourne um, for good buying and for future growth. Which LGOs in Sydney? And ben is asking, show potential for growth? Well, it's a pretty broad question and Sydney is such a big area. Um, there's lots of different answers to that question. I think the Northern Beaches area is gonna do pretty well moving forward at the other end of the scale. Um, locations out west, where the, the new airport's going to be built and the huge jobs node that's going to spring up around that airport means there's going to be a lot of jobs out there, a lot of new infrastructure. So locations like Blacktown, Penrith and Liverpool, I think uh, are all going to benefit from all of that. So those are, you know, follow if, if in doubt, and I made the point earlier about the importance of infrastructure as a generator of real estate markets. Um, if in doubt, follow the infrastructure trail. And that's certainly the case for Sydney going forward. Um, Sue's asking, is Bernie in Tasmania good or has Tasmania had its growth? Look, I think Tasmania and Hobart generally have, have had, you know, two or three pretty good years of growth. Um, and Bernie's obviously been one of the places that's had some growth as well. Uh, that showed up in the figures I presented earlier. Um, so, you know, probably a large part of the growth in this cycle that Hobart and Tasmania generally are going to have has been had. There's probably still some growth to be had this year, but the best time to buy um, was two to three years ago. But uh, keep an eye on those markets because there are things happening that will boost Bernie, there are things happening that will boost Launceston. Um, Uh, Julie's asking for any <clears throat> uh, tips for Western Australia. Well, I think Perth is coming into a, a recovery phase. Again, arising out of vacancies. Vacancies were way too high in Perth for a number of years. They're now down below 3%, so sort I of 2.5% and rents are starting to rise again. And we're starting to see signs of, of recovery in prices. And um, there's all sorts of possibilities in the, the Perth market. Uh, the Joondalup precinct up in the north um, is one. The city of Melville is another. The city of Stirling, um, good prospects for growth. Um, it's a very broad subject. We, we do have a top five um, Perth hotspots report, which discusses some of the areas that we think are worth considering. You mentioned, Julie, Port Headland. I'd be very sort of wary of a market like that. It's, if you're buying regional, I think it's really important to buy in areas that have got diverse economies not um, sort of one horse towns in terms of uh, the economy. Port Hedland's very much 
about the resources sector. And when that's not pumping, Port Hedland struggling and its real estate market prices have more than halved since the peak of the uh, resources investment boom. That's what can happen in places like that. Um, somebody asking about Gladstone, uh, bought in Gladstone eight years ago, why well, it's worth holding on to. Um, yeah, if you, I just suggest that if you've held on this long, probably worth holding on a little bit longer because we're now seeing signs of prices rising in Gladstone. Vacancies, again, it comes down to vacancies have dropped a lot. Rents are rising and we've seen evidence in the last 12 months of median prices starting to rise. Still well below those peak levels, but they're heading now in the right direction. So to the person who put in that question about Glass, and if you held on this long, I'd suggest holding on a bit longer because um, there is um, some upside happening there. Um, uh, Jobby is asking for recommendation for a good buyer's agent. Look, uh, rather than do that now, Jobby, if you just drop me an email, uh, rider, R-Y-D-E, uh, at hotspotting.com.au, and uh, just send me an email and uh, I'll send you some uh, some possibilities for good buyers agents, depending on which part of Australia you want to buy in. Um, let me know where you're thinking of buying and um, I can perhaps give you a recommendation. Um, uh, Afi is asking, can you suggest any good suburbs in WA with growth as well as Good rental return. Um, as the Perth market recovers, the, the Quinana precinct, very, very affordable buying. Most of the suburbs there are median house prices than 200,000, really good rental yields. Um, I think that market, you know, first home buyers are going to target markets like that um, as the Perth market recovers. So that's one possibility. The Joondalup precinct up in the north is another one. Lots of good suburbs there, more expensive than the Quinana precinct. Um, but um, it's a pretty good buying because prices are down. Prices have been sort of gradually falling for four or five years in Perth. So now we're seeing signs of recovery. It's a good time to be taking advantage of that and buying in at those lower prices and uh, sitting back and waiting for the recovery to happen. Um, uh, Peter's asking about Wayala and Port Perry. Um, I think Wyala, I don't know about Port Perry. I haven't looked at that recently, but certainly um, Peter Wyala is definitely on the way back. Again, vacancies have dropped a lot. And in the last 12 months, uh, median prices for you know, many of the components of the Wyala market, Wyala itself, Wyala Norrie, Wyala Stewart, et cetera, have, have risen quite a bit from a low base, but they're on the way back up. And the future of Wyala looks strong because the uh, Mr. Gupta, the billionaire who sort of bought in into the, the local uh, steel business, which is a major employment while he's gonna be investing big time, a uh, billion dollars into Wyala to expand that business um, alternative energy project to provide electricity for and all of that. So I think Wyala is gonna be looking a lot stronger as we go forward. Okay, um, look, we're already gone 10 minutes past the hour and there's still lots of questions, but really um, should probably um, call a halt uh, to the webinar now, otherwise we'll we'll be here in half an hour still answering questions. Look, um, thanks for um, watching and listening today. I hope you got some some clues of um, as to how you can identify uh, some of the better places to buy. Uh, there are some clues there in terms of being aware of what's happening in a local economy. If the local economy is strong, the local real estate market is likely to be strong as well. Um, if sales volumes are rising, that's another indicator that prices will follow. But uh, one of the easy ones is to look at uh, vacancies and rents as a, a future indicator of what's going to happen with prices. Um, and don't forget that special offer um, that I mentioned earlier. I'll just go back a couple of slides. And uh, yeah, strategy session. If you're interested in doing that, it'll be a one-on-one -on -one for an hour with myself, just talking about your situation, some of the things you're thinking of doing. So you'd be amazed how much we can achieve in 60 minutes in terms of uh, understanding your situation, what you're trying to achieve and suggesting um, a way forward. And as part of a strategy session, we always send some uh, uh, reports on the areas that uh, you appear to favor in your strategy. So the price reduced uh, from the normal 330 to 220 and you can sign up 
for a strategy session. If you go to the hotspotting website, uh, click on the investors um, menu and the drop down box should show you strategy sessions and that's where you do it. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for participating. Um, if you have some burning questions that um, I didn't um, get time to answer, drop me an email. Um, I'll just go back to the final slide. Ryder at hotspotting.com.au as shown on the screen. Um, so if you've got some questions that didn't get answered, send it through and I'll do my best in the next day or so to respond to that. Okay, thanks everyone for participating. Hope you got some value from that. And please, if you're interested in uh, having a one-on-one uh, -on -one chat to uh, sort out some plans for the coming year and beyond, uh, please take advantage of that special offer for a strategy session. That's it for now, Terry Ryder from Hotspotting signing off. Let's do it again soon.